Uh, uh, first, I was going to say uh, thanks very much to Dave, the, uh, the Sioux there at uh, Springfield, Missouri, and also Jason for uh, setting this up so I can give this presentation, and also to John. Um, again, my name is uh, Dave Holtz. I'm the science officer from Morristown, Tennessee. Um, I want to present the storm monitor analysis program. Uh, bef but before I do, I, I really want to recognize um, some people that really contributed a lot to this program, uh, especially Jason. Uh, Jason there at Springfield, Missouri. Uh, this, uh, this program would not be possible uh, at all if it wasn't for Jason's hard work. So I definitely want to recognize him. Uh, he's done a lot of work for this program. But we're going to go forward. Great, if you want to go to the next oh, slide, go ahead. I, I'm with you now. <laughs> That's all right. And there we go. Okay. Thanks, Greg. Um, I really, the, the purpose of the storm monitor program, it, it really kind of goes back to uh, some best practices uh, during uh, surface assessments. And, and one of the th things that always comes up is understanding and, and having a good situational awareness of your near storm environment. And this program that we're going to introduce during this presentation is, is a tool that local offices could use on your AWIPS to help you monitor uh, situational awareness across your forecast area. Go ahead there, Greg. Now, what we're going to talk about now is, is pretty much kind of program input. Um, there's really two types of input. We have a wind input and also a kind of thermodynamic input into the program. For the wind input, it really contributes to the shear and helicity values that this program uh, produces. And the type of input for the shear and helicity values, we use the surface observations, such as uh, uh, ASOSs and AWOS sites. And also, you can use kind of an and or. Uh, you can use the wrap winds. Uh, you can also use uh, your VAD wind profile from your radar, use, use winds from there. And also, you can use significant level winds. Um, personally, here in Morristown, we really don't use the SDL because we don't have a, a rave on site here. But you can use those uh, use that information. So again, you have the surface data as well as the winds aloft from the RAP or VWP. Now, for the thermodynamic input, uh, such as like CAPE and DCAPE, um, you can use it's kind of an it's kind of an or. You can use the RAP. Uh, data, or you can use the last data. So you, it's kind of you decide which uh, which data you really want to use for for the thermodynamic information. And as soon as new input comes in, as soon as you get the new new METARs, the BWPs, uh, new update to your RAP, uh, the monitor is continuously updated with the new data. Go ahead, there, Greg. Okay, Dave. This is John. I'm back. Hey, John. John, if you want to go ahead and go to the next slide, go ahead. Oh, OK. There you go. Thanks. OK, uh, under, the, um, under the display menu button, you will get what they call attributes um, uh, table. And that's what you see there in the middle. And that's all the different types of uh, values or parameters you can look at in the program. Uh, right now, there's right around 28 parameters uh, that we have for this program. Uh, and what you'll be able to do, uh, you can take off and on the different parameters. So if you want just uh, certain parameters you want to look at for this event, you, you can put them on and you can leave some of them off. So it's, uh, it's very adaptive to whatever you want to look at for that scenario. Go ahead there, John. Okay, the, the first series of uh, attributes that we have is the shear, shear helicity values. You can turn on the 0 to 1 kilometer, 0 to 3, 0 to 6, 6 kilometer shear. You also have helicity values you can look at, uh, VRN shear. Uh, another thing you can look at as well is the, your buoyancy and instability, instability values. So you can look at the LCL heights. You can look at capes, uh, ML capes, so kind of the... Uh, Hell capes and D capes. There's a lot of different values and look for buoyancy and stability. Uh, the next set of values are your composite parameters. And what we do is we compute the pro composite parameters given the helicity and buoyancy values that we get. And uh, some of the composite parameters that we have uh, is EHI. Uh, you also have a significant tornado parameter. 
uh, Craven and Brooks, a significant severe uh, deratio compositive. Uh, so those are different uh, parameters we can use, uh, composite parameters. Uh, some of the miscellaneous uh, parameters that we have, uh, we do look at, it's called a 50 dBz heights. And what that is, it, it looks at uh, Donovan and Jung Bluff's um, technique that they develop, the regression analysis they develop, and it takes the freezing heights and lets you know what, what values uh, of heights of 50 dBz core heights would be for severe hail. Uh, another thing we look at is uh, precipital water values and the uh, TE difference, what that is, that's the theta E difference between the surface and the, uh, the, min, uh, the minimum level uh, theta E difference. So it kind of gives you a much better chance of seeing potential microburst potential during the event. John, go ahead and go to the next slide. Thank you, John. Okay, now we're going to do is kind of talk about more of the uh, monitor display and let this thing kind of get it figured up. Okay, the first thing you see on the monitor is the left-hand side. And the left-hand side, what that is, is all the different stations uh, that you have set up for your monitor. And uh, really for, for our area here in Morristown, and I'm sure Jason's kind of the same way for Springfield, Missouri, but what we do, we set up all of our different uh, ASOS and all of our AWOS sites within our forecast area and then we also grab a lot of the different observation sites kind of north, west, and south of us. So we have a kind of a feel for what's kind of coming in. But uh, those are the different stations on the left. Go ahead there, John. Uh, and then the, the top part of all the different parameters. One thing you will notice is that um, uh, everything is color-coded. So it's color-coded to let you kind of, uh, it's kind of like the avian FPS. If it, if it gets a certain color like purple, uh, that lets you know these values are really getting pretty extreme values. So it's all, it kind of highlights the uh, potential of, of, of those different parameters. Now the next thing we have is the station tabs. And uh, we'll kind of talk more about the station tabs a little bit here. But the station tabs allows you to uh, look at a timeline graph of all those different parameters. But we'll look at, we'll look at that a little bit more in here, here in a little bit. Okay. Another aspect that you're able to do on the monitor is that you're able to click on the different parameters on top, and it allows you to rank the parameter. So like in this case here, you have ML Cape, you have it ranked from highest to lowest. So you can see what stations and what areas of your forecast area or your warning area that you're really beginning to see a higher potential for that parameter. And here's just another example. If you click on a significant severe, again, you can rank it from highest to lowest. Go ahead there, John. Okay, now the time life graph parameters, how that works is this. Um, from the timeline menu button, you grab whatever you want to look at. So in this case, we're going to look at the Craven and Brick significant severe. So go ahead and go to the next slide, John. And we're going to do is that you grab one of the stations on the top, one of the top tabs. In this case, this is a Greenville, Tennessee. And we're looking at the, the timeline graph for the Craven Brook significant severe weather parameter. And the line that you see that has the arrow, that is the current time. So everything back shows you the timeline graph of this parameter for about the last 24 hours. So we always kind of found that kind of interesting. For one is if you ever do some research in the, in the later on, you can use this timeline graph. Uh, another thing, too, you know, just kind of give you a feel for how this parameter has evolved through the event. Brother Joe. Okay, the next part of, the, of this program is if, you're, when you, if you go from the main uh, monitor, if you click on one of the stations, for example, this is CHA, which represents uh, Chattanooga, for the next slide there, John. What that does, it gives you an interactive photograph. So every station that you have in your monitor you can click up on interactive photograph. And this interactive photograph has, uh, again, your, your current surface observation for that location. And also you can use uh, RAP winds, uh, VWP winds, uh, and also SGL uh, winds. And it gives you a photograph for that location. And the neat thing about this photograph is it's interactive. So all the blue dots, uh, for the different levels is you can move them if you want to. I think the, the greatest feature actually is the yellow dot. And what that is, that is the uh, uh, 
uh, calculated storm motion. So let's just say if you had a storm that latched onto a boundary and decided to go more southeast in the, the, the main flow, um, you can move the storm motion to, to reflect that uh, more of a southeast or kind of right moving flow of that storm. And what you'll do is you can move the yellow a button and move it to, the, to that motion. And then the helicity values and shear values that you see on the top right will also uh, interactively uh, change as well. So you can see how that right moving storm has changed the list and shear values. Go ahead there, John. Go ahead and go to the next one there if you want to, John. Okay, this slide just represents that uh, uh, if you get, when you get this program, you, you do get kind of the set cam uh, the thresholds for the different parameters. But as you as an office, if you want to modify what you want to be as a threshold for those different parameters and how they're color-coded on your monitor, you can change that the way that you want it. And another thing at the very bottom, you see the uh, perceptible water values uh, thresholds on the bottom. You can, you can set the perceptible water thresholds depending on uh, Matt Bunker's um, climatology for your area. Okay, and this kind of goes to what this, this talks about. You know, again, we monitor perceptible water uh, on the monitor, and if you want to go to the next, there you go. Uh, what you can do, you can set it up so it monitors what Matt Bunker has set up on his uh, climatology, and we, we kind of really found that very useful in keeping the forecasters very situation aware that this is an environment that's getting to extreme level. So uh, we kind of found this to be kind of pretty useful for using Matt's uh, climatology. Thank you, John. Uh, Another thing that you're able to do as an office, uh, again, you can, you can change the way that the program is util utilizing the data. For example, uh, in, in the current monitor setup, uh, we're using the RAP winds for the monitor. So we have, so it's currently using surface observations and the RAP winds for determining uh, the shear and helicity values on the monitor. But if you wanted to, you can turn on the significant winds or VWP winds, depending on what you want for those locations. Now, the analysis data, what that allows you to do is to look at, uh, for the buoyancy and stability values, do you want to use the lapse data or do you want to use the wrap data? So you can change that for every station or you can make every station the same. So it kind of gives you the flexibility to set up the way that you want it. Brother John. What I want to do now is give you two operational case examples that we utilized the, the monitor over about the last year or so. Go ahead there, John. Okay, this is during the April 27th uh, tornado outbreak that we had here in eastern Tennessee. Uh, during that time frame, we ended up getting about 50 to uh, 55 tornadoes within about 24 hours time frame. But uh, this is uh, during the event is right around 2Z on the 28th. Um, but you can tell you know, everything just really sticks out real well that the velocity values, the shear values were very, very high. Again, you can look at um, LCL heights. Um, another thing like you can do as well is look at the significant tornado parameter. So all these really parameters, the nice thing about it, they really just kind of stick out at you as a forecaster, and you can see how these things are evolving during the event. Go ahead there, John. Okay, this, this next uh, is the timeline graph for the significant tornado parameter. Uh, this is also during the April 27th event, <clears throat> and this is for uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee. And in Chattanooga, Tennessee area, they had several uh, tornadoes that went right across uh, pretty close to the airport. And what I did, I kind of, uh, kind of highlighted the different times they had the tornadoes. And the neat thing about you can see in this timeline graph is how the uh, STP parameter you know, jumps up pretty much right at the time, almost right at the time that they have these different tornadoes. So I always kind of thought that was kind of interesting for the timeline graph. Okay, this is the, again, this is the same uh, holder graph, but this is the holder graph at Chattanooga uh, pretty much during the time when they had one of their tornadoes. And you can, this obviously kind of sticks right out, out to you that uh, this is a very much a tornado uh, type holder graph uh, for the Chattanooga area. Okay, this is the next event. This is a derecho event we had back in uh, last summer. 
Uh, it was kind of a mini ratio. But what I want to kind of point here is that, again, you can look. The ML capes really stuck out at you. Uh, the other parameters that we see as well is the D cape. Uh, D cape also stuck out. Uh, the theta E difference also kind of sticks out to the forecasters that this is a, a big potential of seeing uh, kind of a high wind event. And the last parameter we stick out as well is the, uh, well, this is the duration of composite parameter. And then also you have a, a significant severe parameter. It was very high that day as well. Okay, this kind of final thoughts to kind of wrap things up. Uh, you know, when Jason and I wrote this program, uh, this is really, I think, a very great program for situation awareness, but we also want, also want to stress to our forecasters that this is just one tool to use in your, as a toolbox. Uh, definitely, I always tell our forecasters here to use the SPC Mental Analysis page. It's a great, great uh, diagnostic tool. Uh, AWIPS with this LAPS data, MS, MSAS data. So there's a lot of other tools you can use besides the program. But again, this program is a great, I think we feel like it's a great tool to use uh, for situational awareness. Um, another thing we want to do, we wanted to acknowledge um, uh, some different people allow us to use some of their code. Uh, Jim Raymer um, allows us to use the test, uh, test grab, uh, grid slash wrapper program. This is a program that, uh, that Jason was using a lot to grab the kind of the instability and buoyancy parameters uh, off the, like the wrap and the, and the lapse, uh, lapse models. And also we want to recognize Matt Bunkers. <coughs> uh, Matt uh, allowed me to use his shear velocity calculations uh, and also for his uh, PW climatology. And last, uh, uh, see if there's any questions, but we want to let you know that the storm monitor program, we are planning on migrating over to AWIPS 2. Uh, I was talking with Jason here just not too long, uh, a couple days ago. It, it is going to be a process to get that done, but th that is something we plan on working on. So if you have any questions about the program, if you're interested, you know, feel free to, to call myself or Jason. Uh, we'll be happy to work with you. All right, well, thank you very much there, John. Well, thank you, Dave. Uh, we sure appreciate, appreciate it. And also, uh, Jason, are you on the line, too? I, what? I am. Okay, I <laughs> just want to say thank you. Uh, I think you both uh, did some great work here. Uh, and uh, any questions uh, from uh, any of the Sues or anybody else in the audience? Got one from Jackson. The parameters when you set up your thresholds and all, is that saved and stored per user, you know, the uh, forecaster, or is that as an office a whole? Okay, that's, that's a good question. What, what we have it set up is that when you first get it into your, um, your office, It'll be set up as just an office, but as the as the uh, different forecasters utilize it, what it'll do, it will save a copy of the attributes parameters list within their home directory. So the next time they get in there, it'll have just a list of what what they want to look at. So it it will it will get it set up so every user can look at whatever they want to look at. So that pretty much means that if you're on a, if you're on workstation two, and you have another forecaster workstation four, you guys can look at different things. Does that answer your question? Yes, excellent. Thank you. Uh -huh. Yeah, question from Chicago here. Yeah. Noticed in your uh, timeline graphics, the uh, frequency of update um, would change a little bit there. For instance, at STP timeline you showed from the April 27th, 11th, 2011 event. I um, was wondering what dictated that frequency of, of update. Uh, was that be dependent on the, the data that is going in there, the vertical wind profile, for instance, updating more frequently? At a lot times, of times the reason why you have a really disparity between, you know, how many times it's updated has to do, let's just say <clears throat> for Chicago, <clears throat> Excuse me. If you have Chicago and you have series of uh, special uh, METARs that come in, well, every time one of those specials come in, it's going to recalculate uh, those values. So, you know, sometimes, again, sometimes you might have maybe some hour one is going to update like once or twice or maybe twice an hour, but then if you might have a couple hours, it might update a whole bunch just because you have specials coming in. So that's totally dependent on the surface observation. 
Exactly. So any, anytime you have any type of data, either uh, surface observations or your VWP updates uh, or the wrap uh, is updated, uh, your monitor and also the, the plot that you see is going to be updated. All right, great. Yeah, I can see that more frequent update being a real benefit of this tool over, say, a, a meso-analysis and hourly update, something that would update more regularly, such as observation site, or if you have your lab set to update every half hour. So exactly. appreciate it. Great presentation, Dave. Sure, thank you. A any other questions out there? Is there somewhere we can download this program right now? Okay, that's, yeah, I know for the LAD is now closed up. If you want, I should have, I should have said this, but if, if you want the latest uh, update to the program, you know, feel free to email me and, um, or Jason, and we'll, we'll get you the latest, uh, we'll get you the latest updated uh, software, and also we'll send you um, uh, the latest uh, documentation on the program. Got a question from Des Moines. Thanks for your presentation. Um, the photograph we saw, the storm motion there was the 30R75. Are you using bunkers or is that Okay, what you can used? do uh, for the um, for the, 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 the storm motion, you can change that. You can, um, it defaults, I think it kind of defaults to the one that you, that you, you said. But you can, you can change on the monitor, you can change the default storm motion uh, on the fly if you want to. But in, like in this case here, when it comes to the hodograph, uh, you can change the storm motion within the hodograph. So if you want to take the yellow dot and move it around and change it, you can do that. I hope I answered your question. Yeah, so could you, for the default, can you have that default to the bunker's motion, or you have to move the dot to get that? Uh, initially, I'll default to the bunker's motion. But from, the, from there, you can change it on the hodograph. OK, thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Uh, Dave, this you is have John. I have a quick question for you. I, I put this back up here, and I noticed um, that sometimes there's uh, two uh, uh, data points at a given time, or three in some instances. Is that, uh, what was typically that? Is that just because a METAR came in at the same time as a, a new VWP, or is? Um... Yeah, that's pretty much what's going on, John, is that you just have uh, kind of overlapping data coming at exactly the same time. So it, it kind of calculates two two values for that same time frame. Um, that's that's one of the features of the program that we we can kind of change a little bit. But that that's how, that's what's happening. Well, no, that I, I actually that that's good. I mean, you can you can know if your data is coming in too. Yeah. <laughs> it, does it become obvious if if something if suddenly you lose some data on a whips or it's uh, not you know somehow there's a failure somewhere? Is it just that the data just goes away, and you, it just, uh, or does I, I didn't know if there was something after a certain period of time, uh, okay. like some of the, uh, like some, maybe an FPS. Yeah, these just kind of uh, zero out or something like that. I know you have last update, but I didn't know if, you know, if it got really long, you know, like we're talking about hour, yeah. hour and a half. Does I didn't know if those change color or something like that. You know, I don't, I don't think the current version of this uh, monitor does that, but that's something we could probably add. Uh, maybe for, like, the last update, if it doesn't change, uh, if you don't get the latest update, maybe it changes color on you, just kind of let you know. Yeah. That's, that's a good point. A any other questions out there? I want to say, if you do have any questions later, uh, you know, feel free to, to ask uh, Jason, myself. You know, one thing about this program, uh, when, I was, when I was talking to Jason a couple of days ago, uh, we really kind of really kind of wrote this program as almost like a prototype, uh, something that we thought we kind of need to have in local offices. Um, uh, like I told Jason, I, I am not I am not a professional pro programmer, and uh, I can only go so far. So you know, we we would like to try to develop this a lot more than what it really is, and, and hopefully, our, our vision down the road is that maybe. 
uh, some guy that has much more programmability than me uh, can take this over and really run with it. But uh, maybe it's a national program. But uh, but but we definitely like to kind of show the possibility uh, w with this uh, monitor. Thank thank you, John. No, uh, thank you, Dave, uh, and also uh, Jason for all your work with this. Uh, we sure appreciate.